Today what we're really focusing on is mid-construction blower door test. We're going to do it in the context of the step code. So we're really going to talk, you know, do a really introduction to the step code, what it is, how you can comply with it, um, and then uh, focus a lot on air leakage. Um, and then looking at a mid-construction blower door test. We want you walking out of here to have a really good understanding about what the step code is, right? What is this thing? How do you comply? And what's the importance of air tightness? How can you get to an airtight home? Wh and what are the processes and steps along the way? How can you engage with an energy advisor to help you get there? For those of you building in the township of Langley, just introducing where they're at with the step code, they've introduced uh, a couple of tiers of the step code. One's inside their development permit area, they're looking at step two. Outside their development permit areas, it's step one in 2019, and they're planning on incrementally increasing these over time. Uh, and part of that will be in consultation with builders who are building in the area and working with them on the capacity and how it's going over the next couple of years. Over the last couple of years, and currently, uh, the Township of Langley has a range of different financial incentives um, for you to hit different steps and to hire an energy advisor. The Township of Langley's been doing that to support builders with the financial cost, sort of engage you to say, great, here's, dip the toe in the water, here's some financial support to help get an energy advisor, and or if you build the certain steps of the step code. I'd encourage you, if you are building um, in, in the Township of Langley, to engage with an energy advisor, when Stan walks through later today, he'll really show like, what he does um, and how he helps identify and quantify the air leakage issues. And most builders we've worked with over the years have really thought that test was like just how valuable that test was for them going, aha, like light comes on. That's, I, I always do that. I've always had air leakage issues or I might not have even known that was an air leakage issue. And it's the simplest thing to fix sometimes. We have a copy of the, of the Township of Langley Compliance Report right here. So if you're going to put in a building permit in the Township of Langley or other local government areas have a different version of this report, it's going to be a report like this what an energy advisor will create. Um, so what we want to do today is go over that, this report, what's in it, um, and then what the importance of getting the right information to the energy advisor um, in that report. So first thing we want to look in at is just a really like a high level overview of what the step code is. Primarily it's a performance based approach. In the past the building code's been a prescriptive approach. It says do this, insulation here, this, that, this type of windows, this, there. That's what it's been based on. Studies that were done on homes built that way found that it wasn't really achieving the intent of code in terms of energy efficiency. So they've gone to a performance based approach which means you have a consultation with an energy advisor, an energy modeler. They take details from your plans. They take details and build it up your types of heating systems. They put it into an energy model and they do air leakage tests. What they do is they take all the types of information from you, put it in there and come up with the step code metrics. And when we go through this report, we're going to start talking about what makes up these different metrics. So if you're not passing one reason or another, we're going to focus on why might not you be passing on this particular metric and, and take a look at what you can do in the building. It's also a voluntary compliance option. So as noted, the Township of Langley's had incentives for the last couple of years, and, and many, some builders have, many builders have picked that up and decided to do it voluntarily. Uh, many builders across the province have already been building for many, many years to all of the steps in the step code, including step five. Um, it's also voluntary for local governments to adopt it. So that's why the Township of Langley has adopted it. They've come to it, which then makes it mandatory for builders working there. But the Township of Langley has decided to take the step to adopt the step code. This is where we're going nationally. Canada's starting to develop a a performance-based building code. And so what British Columbia has decided to do, and they decided to do it by 2030, decided to do 2030 is pretty close when we talk about the building industry and changing how we're changing the building industry, is to start now or start a few years ago so that we have more time for local governments to introduce lower steps so that by 2030, wherever it's going to sit, we've had a good 10, you know, 12, 13 years to, to work with the building industry and build capacity in the industry. And what it is, essentially, it's a pathway to net zero construction. When we look at the steps, there's five of them. Step five is supposed to be net zero ready, which essentially means this home is efficient enough. If you were to put some sort of renewable energy on it, it would be able to generate as much, much electricity or energy as needed within a year. But the first step of the step code, step one, is enhanced compliance. What that essentially means is that if you were to achieve step one, you're essentially achieving the BC building code on a performance path, or a little bit better. That's the intent of it. And so really what, it, and they were trying to say in the past, often when people looked at homes built to code, it wasn't really clear often when the building inspectors came and looked at it that it was really meeting the intent of the code. And that's why they're having a performance-based approach where they have energy modeling, uh, air leakage testing to actually determine how leakage, you can't really tell or quantify how much air leakage is coming out of the house by walking around and taking a look. 
you can make some sort of assumptions on this is going to be a, a leaky home or not, but you can't really quantify if it's really meeting the intent of code for air leakage just by walking around and not doing the testing. So what it's, the step code is meant to be is a consistent approach. It basically says here we have five steps. You can still build built green and build to step two or three. You can still build energy star, you can still build passive. You can build all these other programs if you want, if you're a builder aligned with one of those programs and still meet the step code. So it's not saying you can't do those things, but it's saying there is a consistent approach that is adopted. And how it does this, it sets a series of measurable energy efficiency targets. And we'll focus on these uh, again through the day. What we're really focusing on the measurable targets of air leakage. We will go over the other metrics as well. That's more of the focus of this afternoon's work session is really to dig deep into the other ones. We'll particularly focus on the step code metrics that air leakage impacts. And there, there, and there are many of them. The focus of the step code too, while there's a range of metrics, is really to focus on the building envelope. Essentially, you can't build a home that doesn't have a good building envelope. And increasingly, step one, it's, you know, it's a, a lesser efficient. Step two, it's mo you need a better building envelope. Step three, better and four, et cetera. It really forces you to focus there. In some past programs in the past, it would be just, you know, you can throw a really high efficient a gas boiler system or a heat pump in, and you can pass. And so the intent of that is, is not that. Mm -hmm. It's like heating systems come and go, right? They get what's the life of a heating system, but the building envelope's for, for forever, right? So you should build the best building envelope you can for that step, whichever approach you decide to build your building envelope and then focus on having you know, smaller, more efficient heating systems, whichever type of system you're, you're providing. And air leakage is an essential part of the integrity of that building envelope and, and generally how much energy you're gonna consume within the home. So and there's also what the step code provides too, unlike the prescriptive path of the building code, it's a lot more flexibility. You can choose all kinds of different options. It, it's not like um, you can choose all kinds of options, you have more and more flexibility to use many different things where in the times in the past you were a little bit more forced by the prescriptive code to build a certain way. In this case, and this is why you involved an energy advisor, there's no fixed recipe, but you know, how are you building? Well, one, you might have a, a regulatory step code target you have to meet or a bylaw, but then a builder might want like building a certain way. Their client might be asking for something, that they, that they want a different type of heating system that might be much more efficient. So they can take, okay, we're going to take that into consideration. That's going to help me meet my target. Or they just say, like, I found a more, way more efficient way for our team to build. We can build way better foundations this way. I'm going to get a lot more here. I'm going to spend more here, and that's going to help me achieve my target, and I'm going to save here. So there is much more flexibility overall to do different things as a builder to achieve the step code target. And that's why we have builders that are in this now are sort of experimenting with different ways of building. And they're saying, great, I, this is really starting to work when we do this type of approach. We're going to keep doing that because we're going to nail this and get this more and more cost effective. It also is a standardized reporting process. So this um, one you have in your hand and the one in the province is essentially the same thing. You'll be seeing something like this for every home you put in for the step code, right? And the intent is they're asking for everything. Everything that's on there, if you're, as long as that's complete and correct, that makes your code compliant having on that form. So it sort of lets you know, what do I need to have here to make sure I'm code compliant? This is it. That's it, that sheet right there. And it's also a tool for consumer and industry protection. As people are being asked to meet the code, if you're a builder building a great home that's being sold, uh, and someone's building a less great home, this provides one more way for you to say, yeah, look, I've met the intent of code here. In the past, there was, you know, you'd hear things, well, these people are, these people are building to code and they're just sort of getting away with it and what's happening. The intent of now for you protecting you as industry is to say, great, I'm building good homes, here's how I prove it. In terms of energy efficiency, there's lots of other things that comes into building a good home. This is, but this is the energy efficiency proof. It's also consumer protection. They know if they want to buy an efficient home of a certain level, they can say, well, I want a step five home. Step four, step three, step one, whatever. That, you know, of, of course, consumers are still just, just as the industry is, becoming aware of what the step code is and what it means. But over time, this is going to be something that people more are increasingly uh, familiar with. So another thing, this has been really been a collaborative effort developing the step code. There's been a lot of people, like Larry, involved. A lot of industry. I don't think over the years I've been in energy efficiency. I've seen so much involvement from in different industry groups, uh, different levels of government, local governments have really been involved trying to get make something happen. And I think well, there's still a lot of discussion and things happening on to evolve the code and make it be make it better for industry, including doing a lot of training. Uh, and, and supporting builders with incentives like the Township of Langley's doing. So at a really high level, that's what the step code is. And what we're doing right now is we're gonna start focusing on some of the really specifics of stuff. So what does it measure? We're really focusing today on air changes per hour and how it measures air changes per hour and then going into the other metrics. One of the things it measures is the building envelope and they do that in thermal energy demand intensity. And what thermal demand energy intensity is, is essentially 
the, the heat loss of your, your walls, your, your envelope, your windows and doors, and your air leakage, and the heat recovery from exhaust ventilation. So while there's an air leak leakage on your chart there, a target you have to meet, if you're really leaky on that, you can also might get penalized in your Teddy target. You have a target to meet for your Teddy to meet. So it, multiple of these uh, things, if you don't pass on your air leakage, you might not pass on another metric. So it's important when we go through this, too, we'll start talking about the inter interconnection between this, because you can hit one target by hitting it, but you might not hit another target because they're all interconnected. And your energy advisor, when you work with them, will explain all these things and say, great, you're not going to hit this. You need to do something else. Here's 10 options of things you can do. What do you want to do? So you'd sit down and say, great, well, you could do a little more attic insulation, a bit better window, put in an HRV. And that's the conversation an energy advisor has for all of these things linked to hitting a target. But it measures the performance requirements for equipment and systems, so me mechanical energy use intensity. So mechanical energy use intensity is the energy used by your, your heating system, your cooling system. In this place, it's a, it's a gas heating system and a heat pump. Uh, your fans and your service water heating and any pumps or auxiliary HVAC equipment you may have. And because all of these are intensity metrics, it's how much you use divided by the heated floor area. So it says, great, you're using this amount of energy in this home from your heating systems, but your end target that you hit, it just depends on the size of your home, because you're going to divide it by that. So the larger your home in this particular scenario, the lar because this is a large home, it made it easier for it to hit its MUI because you're dividing it there. In other cases, it's not easier to meet it because it's a larger home. For example, on the Teddy, which we'll talk to in a second. But because people build in different ways, the size of your home, and uh, sometimes the location really makes a difference with step code metrics, because if you're living in an area where there's uh, a lot more heating degree days, you're going to need your heating system a lot more, that's going to impact your MUI, right? So all these things come into consideration and need to be balanced, and that's why you provide the energy advisor with all this information, which would look at the climate zone, takes all these pieces together. In this same house, if we popped it around the province, would have di very different step code metrics, depending on where we put it. You might have different types of heating systems. You might not put a heat pump in certain areas of the province. So you might make different decisions based on where you're at um, and the type of heating system you may want to put in. The intent is not to build homes or set targets that people can't meet. The, the intent is to set a performance-based targets, see what happens and comes in, adjust, go onward, adjust, I go onward, and that just has the building codes happened over the years when we had for the grilling code. It gets set, it gets adjusted over time, right? It gets set, it gets adjusted. Sometimes annoying when you don't want it to be adjusted, um, but that's what's going to continue to happen, and hopefully for the better. The main topic we're going to take today is the air tightness metric. So we look at air, ti air tightness, and what that is, it's how much air leaks in or out of a building, and it's the air leakage rate. And what it does is it takes how much air that comes through the airflow divided by the volume of the home, right? So we, again, this is an intensity metric. So this home, because it's larger, in one sense, it's easier to hit an air tightness target overall because you're dividing it by the volume. In the second sense, it's harder because there's a lot more places you need to, you know, you need to pay attention to because there's a lot more chances for error. Um, so it's, it's really important that we think about that because people are sometimes in smaller homes with very small, little tiny bits of leakages in a small home can have a much bigger impact because you're dividing it by, you know, you're talking about a little laneway home a couple of air, air leakage spots, and if you finish, find this about it after, and it's behind the walls and you can't fix it, that can like wreck your day. So, but where a couple of little leaks in this home, because it's a larger home, it might not have as much impact. But nevertheless, a lot more attention needs to be put into air tightness and the air barrier in this type of a home, because it's larger. So there's a few different things we look at, uh, units of air tightness measurement. The primary one you're going to look at is air changes per hour at 50 pascals. And Stan, when he talks, he'll talk about the measurement and show you what he's doing and how he's doing that and what 50 pascals means. But we're looking at, again, the number of times the total volume of air in the building is replaced with outdoor air. There's also equivalent air leakage, which Stan will do for you. How big are the holes when they're all added together? So if you've got a whole bunch of number of one inch holes, it's kind of good to sometimes builders want to know, how am I doing with my air leakage? Just gives you a metric to know, is it some big holes? A couple big holes, or is it a whole pile of teeny tiny holes everywhere? And that's sort of important for you to know, because if you're guiding your crew into fixing something, is this just a couple problems that are larger problems, or is it a whole pile of little ones? I mean, the whole pile of little problems is probably the more difficult to fix, but that's a kind of a good a metric for you to understand and know. And builders, sometimes builders are tracking that through their builds over time. Like, how am I doing on these things? The other one is normalized leakage area, was how much air is leaking 
based on the size or the surface area that compared to the surface area of the building. These are all things, if you start doing air leakage metrics and people that sort of you know, tech out on these things start tracking these types of things, more energy advisors, they'll do it for you and then sort of describe it more plain, uh, plain terms in terms of saying, here's what this information tells you. And that's why you want to have an energy value. They tell you, they <coughs> decipher all that information for you and break it down and just say, go fix there, there, and there. That's what you need to do. Get her done. Why is this important? Well, one, the step code set a target. If you fail, except for in step one, if you fail in air leakage for step two, three, four, or five, you're, you're done, right? You, you don't pass. Um, so the intent is, as by engaging an energy advisor early, potentially doing mid-construction blower door test and making it, you make sure you don't fail. The air tightness impacts these other metrics that we'll look at. And the third one, which is why this, the step codes also come into play, is that in the lower mainland and where we're at now, uh, homes have typically been built leakier. So if we look at the median air tightness, this is 2017, um, 1,500 homes. So these are homes that have had energy evaluations and lower door testing. So builders that are typically <coughs> been paying more attention to air tightness because they're having, they've either been required to or doing it voluntarily. The median air leakage for single detects is 3.49. So if you look here, they're not going to pass step two because that's the requirements three. They're not going to pass anything. So row houses, uh, middle units and end units are even leakier with 4.1 or 4.72. The median is there. So what it shows, even people that are participating, the median air leakage rate is not passing. Now on step one, they can pass, right? And we'll go into that, how you can pass at step one in a moment. But that's the importance of saying that's what's happening right now. So the province and local governments are trying to get people to improve on the median. Again, the median is like taking some of the good and the bad in there. But again, these are likely, with the exception of the city of Vancouver is just requiring everyone to doing it, um, and probably more of these homes, um, we need to improve on that. Um, when we look at the step code, um, or center guide rating system, the building code, they're thinking that, well, a home built to code should have 2.5 air changes an hour. But this shows that we're not there, right? Generally. Um, in other provinces and other places where it's colder and builders have been doing it differently, um, likely often because it's colder there and they have to do air leakage or people can't live in their homes because it's so damn cold in the winter. But we're just going to skip ahead a couple slides to really focus on the compliance report again. And one of the things it asks is what's your air barrier system and location? Is it poly? Is it, what is it? Spray foam on interior of walls, ceilings, and concrete, right? So you have to list that in the report. If it was something different, you have to list it. When the building inspector looks at this report, they're also going to look at your plans. And they're going to see, OK, well, where is your air barrier list? And we'll take a look at what they require in the township of Langley. And they'd also look at all the other pieces on your plan and say, great. It may be at the case when you're working with your energy advisor in the beginning, you haven't got anything figured out. The client hasn't told you what type of heat, heating system you're going to put in yet. So as you're, you're working with your energy advisor to propose where you think you're going to sit in your step code metrics, they have to put something there. So, well, is it likely you're putting in a heat pump? Well, then I'm going to put, are you likely putting in a gas boiler? Okay, great. Well, we'll put something in now and see where you sit to see if you're going to be okay with this building envelope and with this air barrier approach. And that he might, that Stan might ask too, it's like, well, have you done this type of air barrier approach before? It's like, nope. Okay, well, let's, let's how should we adjust it? Where, where should we sit you now and your clients to make sure that we're helping you to plan to hit the target? What we see here on the, the chart, this is, the, this is what really makes all the difference on the compliance report. It's this chart right here. This says your step code level you need to meet. This one wasn't required, but it's step code three. Initially, this will go, the story of this home initially was gonna be step four. When they removed PTL, and with PTL when it was peak thermal load, this home was a step four home. Because they removed PTL on the last change of the code, uh, this one became a step three home. Um, unless, unless Teddy's changed, but we'll look at that for, for now for a second. So when we look at mechanical energy use intensity, here it shows they can have a maximum of 55. Here they have 24. So it's far surpassing where it needs to be on mechanical energy use intensity. Look at percentage lower than reference house. The minimum it needs to be, this is different. The minimum it can be is 20. This is different from maximum here. So the minimum has to be 20. Here we got 62.6, so far above. So it's, you know, it's swimmingly passing on these two things here. So this, mechanical energy use intensity again, is your heating systems, your hot water, that, that's what that is. If you weren't passing here, it's the, the energy advisor would say, well, you've got to get a more efficient bo gas boiler, a more efficient heat pump, or a combination of that, or a better heating system. When we're looking here, percentage less than reference house, if they weren't passing, then it could be bas just basically anything in the home. Well, you could do better air tightness, 
better heating systems will help you get better here because all these things are included in here. It's a building envelope. Everything's included in this. This is an also, in the case here, an either or. If you failed on one of these, but you passed on one, you're good. You only have to pass on one of these things, right? So you have more options to pass in the step code with these two things. However, thermal energy demand intensity, because peak thermal load was removed from the step code, it's just this one thing, right? So you have to pass on this. The thermal energy demand intensity, again, is your building envelope, right? It's your windows, it's your air leakage. So air leakage, if you have really poor air leakage, for example, it's going to impact your teddy. Not only do you have to get 2.5 here, this is the requirement, and this home at mid-construction is 1.1. Right, so what, when Stan came and did a pre with this test and showed where you're at, are you going to pass on here? Well, you're way, you're way beyond passing. And if this was way worse, and we'll look at it in a second, if this was way worse, it would have impacted the teddy on this home. Again, this home achieving a good teddy is a little more challenging. It's a larger home, it's more building envelopes, so lots, lots of things to, and it's a harder target to meet. Again, the step code is forcing people to hit, have a better building envelope. But this is really the one you need to focus because you have more options to, Pass here, less here. So this is where we're at. Now, if we look at this, and again, it, we're at 1.1, you know, he, he's sit, hitting the uh, step four requirement for air tightness here. So we're already at step four for air tightness in this home, but just step three for Teddy. So you can meet different things. Here we're at mechanical energy, where, you know, we're step five for mechanical energy use intensity in this home. So when, you sit, when someone was saying it's not possible to meet it, it's, you can hit it in different ways and different things. If we were to hit step five here, we'd have to do obviously much more on the Teddy. So again, I just said here, here we're fine, here we're fine. There, we're currently on the line, doing fine, but on the line. Right now, they have to make sure they don't go beyond 1.38 air changes or that would impact the Teddy. And when Stan took a look, he did a pre-test earlier today, it was already better than when he was here before. So now they're at the time, they've made sure they've hit it. We're at mid-construction, they have even more opportunities to, that we'll take a look at when we go through. Here's a couple areas we could fix in the homes. They intentionally left them so we can take a look at them together. When they fix those, we know, here's where we're at, we've got a plan to get to, to final construction, no problem, you're good. If you were not passing at that point, you gotta spend extra time to make sure you get this air leakage right. And if you can't do the air leakage right, then you gotta do something else with the building envelope. But at this point in construction, what are you gonna do with the building envelope, right? Not much, right? You're not going to want to take out windows and put out something else already. So again, this case is no problem. Other homes he hits and it is a problem. Then he's like, you got to do a lot more, like the 40 hours that builder spent on air, leak air leakage tight tightness testing to get to the end. That's additional 40 hours of crawling around, not quite sure if he was getting there or not. So again, what the energy advisor would say, if you weren't passing here and you said, I can't, I'm not going to hit this air tightness target, then he would go, well, here's your list of options for Teddy. What do you want to do and cost it out? And it's probably not, neither of them are going to be cheap or fun, but he would provide you with a list of things for you to decide what to do. But Stan or another advisor would always advise you, well, go to your max here, plan your building envelope so you can go air leakage all the way up to this 2.5 if you need to, right? Just to give yourself some buffer. Unless you're absolutely sure you're going to hit it. And Dave here was like, I'm sure we're going to hit it. And they did hit it. That's good to know because they know they've got their air barrier plan in place and who's going to be doing their work. We've been working on air tightness blower door testing for about six years and uh, our average has been under two and that includes some homes about five, six years ago where we used, uh, we used uh, the poly as an as a air barrier, which I hate using, you hear more about that. So those homes were I think uh, three and a half and that was included in the numbers. So when we moved to exterior air barriers, Tyvek, tight tape it, uh, we consistently are in that one to two range without really going, going crazy and trying to work on every little leak. And so it's, it's, not, that, it's not as difficult as you think to get to, to, to a one. When you have a very complicated house like this one, timber frame, uh, different levels, we didn't want to take any chances. So we did spray foam in this one. But uh, if you learn to use something like the Sega wrap, uh, you, you should be able to get to you can easily get under one. The passive house guys, a lot of the guys I talk to, are easily getting under one. They think one is, is too easy to hit. So I wouldn't get too intimidated, but I would be starting to think, get rid of poly and move your air barrier to the outside. We've been doing that for, say, five, six years now, and that would be one of the things I'll talk more about later. What's the design 
that you're going to put in for the, what's your error barrier approach? Like you're deciding that. Is it going to be poly? Is it going to be this? And if it's poly, then you think, okay, well, if it's poly, um, the Township of Langley is now requiring error bar barrier details in your building plans. This is going to ask you what you're going to do. They're going to require it on the plan, specifically, John, we'll look at a slide in a minute. And then having someone on your team, who's the responsible for the error barrier? Who's the person that's tracking this all the way along? They know what it is from the plans all the way through the build. Someone that's there. There's going to be an issue. They hopefully know, here's my common issues. Likely on a poly, these are where all my issues are going to be. I kind of already know. So along the way, I'm checking those issues as we go. Um, again, it's not required, um, but there's an optional mid-construction blower door test. And then at the end of the day, there's the, the final test, so along the way. When I was looking at this house, I was certain that I could get a good air test if I was using spray foam. I'm very familiar with spray foam. Um, so I wasn't afraid of the air, uh, the, the air test target. The biggest problem was I needed to convince the owner of this house to invest the money in it. And the way I did that is I said, well, where are all the ducts going to go? What are we going to do? Are we going to have drops everywhere? Um, what, what, what kinds of other things are going to happen if we put spray foam in that are benefits? And let's, let's knock some of those costs off. And, and put them towards the, the investment in spray foam. So, and I'm, spray foam is one, one solution, uh, like, like Larry said. But, but I would say that the owner probably got back all of the money he invested in the spray foam here, at least in other benefits. There's no one, you know, one right option. Uh, and that's what builders are looking at. What are my costs for doing it this way? Some clients are gonna not want spray foam, some do. I don't know if Stan wants to speak to that, but there's different, again, there's different costs for different things, and that's all, all the things to take into consideration. Again, as noted, this house was a more complex house, so they thought spray foam was going to be a lot easier than doing some other approaches for this particular house. Again, Township of Langley, they're going to require on their building plans for homes like over step three and above that you show um, where the air barrier is. So there's gonna, they're going to require and they're going to look at that with your step code compliance report and the air leakage where it is. That's going to be something they want you to start looking at this at an early stage. The building plans, what's your plan? How's it going to work? Great. Um, so sort of forcing people to like really focus on that air barrier. The air tightness can be that wild card. So Stan, do you want to just add speak to what you would say to most builders when they try to uh, propose an air tightness target? At pre-construction, um First thing to do is, oh, what city are you building in? Oh, what are the requirements? Maybe it's, it, these days it's, uh, it's, it's set one, two, or three. I don't, I'm sure that there's nobody requiring anything else. Uh, so then I give the builder an idea. Oh, so you're building here and you need step three. I just let you know, like right from the get go, that there are a couple of new things that are happening that, are, that we're requiring. Good air tightness, perhaps, that you've never done before. Uh, thicker walls, you, you may only have built with two by six, better windows. And so from there, I'll model the house. I'll, I'll, well, before, before I get going on upgrades, I'll also speak to the builder. Is there anything that you absolutely don't want to do? And I'll you know, keep that off. So then I'll go to work. When, when I have the upgrades, now the thing is, Good, if, if we specify and the builder agrees to good windows, a certain mechanical system, uh, certain walls, it's a slam dunk at that point. Someone just needs to write the check and the builder and, and the team just needs to build that and you're done. But there's no guarantee. Peter uses, uses the term wild card. So if you order these triple glazed windows, they come on site, they're installed, well, nobody's going to dispute on you on that. I'm not, the inspector's not, oh yeah, the label says USI 1.5, you're good to go. But air tightness, air leakage, you don't know that you've met, say, the 2.5 <coughs> until the day the energy advisor comes for final and does the test. Everything else you know, but air, that's the tricky thing with air leakage, and that's why, as Peter pointed out, it's best to err on the conservative side, to have a bit of a buffer. Thanks, Dan. So. Again, just a quick review of looking at some of the gives and takes. For step one, it shows here, there's no air tightness target. And there's only the percentage better than the reference house. So you have all the options here to do it. But what this does, percentage better than the reference house, 0% better than this, it assumes a 2.5 air change an hour within there, right? 
So it's assumed that you're going to get it to get 0%. If you know you're not going to get better, or Stan knows you're not going to get better, another energy, no, you're not going to get better percent they'll already say, great, well, you need to do something else. Right? There's a give and take, right? So that, let's just say you do hit 2.5, then you can just build basically code home. Like, you know you're going to get 2.5, you're mid-construction there, it can be pretty much just code. However, if you're not sure you're going to get there, the energy advisor would say, okay, well, if you think you're going to get 3.5, well, then you need to do, let's say, R22 effective wall. So you get more insulation or an HRB. Here's your two options. What do you want to do? They would say, like, just give it to me. I'll model it in. Let's say you're thinking you're going to get 4.5, and they might, with a builder that hasn't built to the level, say you're probably 4.5 safe for you to go, or even 5.5 or more. But here's your options now. R28 walls or an HRB and better windows or some other combination of things. These are just examples, right? But that's what the advisor is going to say to you. If he thinks you're maybe hitting seven air changes, you can still get seven air changes an hour in step one or 10. But he's, they're going to say, here's a range of things you need to do and look at the cost. And when you start adding up the cost, then it partly also says, wow, it probably would be good for us to focus more on air leakage because that's going to be a lot cheaper. Because that's going to be some labor rather than these better windows, the HRB and this extra insulation. So the, the cost benefit of really planning for a good air barrier and putting the time and effort into training a team to do it can start to pay off, particularly at step one, when you have more flexibility, right? But it's not a fail, a pass or fail in air leakage. It's a plan and pass. Plan what your other option is, then try and do as best you can on air leakage. And as Stan says, the builders he works with get better and better in their air leakage each time. What energy advisors try to do, if you align yourself with a good one that gets to know you and your building crew and team, the more better they know you and your team, the better they can help you because they're like, great, I know you like to build like this. Here's where we saw some issues last time. Let's make sure we plan ahead. Here's the best way we think you can get there. And that's kind of their job is to help you get there and decipher the step code stuff and all these metrics. Like, what does this mean if I'm not passing my MIUI? So now we're just going to go a brief introduction to the mid-construction blower door test. So what a mid-construction blower door test is, it's a test which sort of either depressurizes or pressurizes the home slightly to identify issues in the home. And what it does is it quantitatively indicates if the proposed building right now, if we think it's going to pass. Now, we can't always say it's going to pass. In certain cases with poly in particular, we can't depressurize the home as we might just pull the poly off. But so what it does, it allows you to indicate where we think the eye leakages are and think you're on the right path. With different types of building air barrier approaches, you can depressurize it more. For this one, for example, you can depressurize more if it's not poly, right? So you have more options to depressurize and get a better indication that you're on track. Stan, anything else you'd like to say about that? So generally, mid-construction blower door test might also be called a pre-drywall blower door test. That perhaps is a bit inaccurate because if your air barrier is somewhere else, then it doesn't need to be pre-drywall. But it needs to be at a time when 100% of your air barrier is installed. So if you think back to think about a conventional poly house, it means of course the poly is all installed, caulked, taped. But if you've got some flat ceilings, ceilings under decks that are say to be spray foamed or rigid or whatever you're doing, and it hasn't been scheduled or done yet, well then there may not be an air barrier. So so it's not just that the poly's done, but that whatever your air barrier is going to be on all sides of the house is done. And typically for a poly house, that is just prior to insulation inspection, which is just prior to, to drywall insulation. <coughs> uh, so that's when we do it. Uh, the house also needs to be in a relatively sealed state. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to do the test. What do I mean by that? Uh, if a transom is missing, is on order, and you just have a, a, a roughly placed piece of uh, particle board, well, you'd have to take care of that. If uh, a window, um, they delivered the wrong size, and so you've just got, got a hole in the wall. Well, we can go ahead with the mid-construction test, but you need to seal it up, perhaps a sheet of poly, for example. One of the things, if you're building, you have crews working, we typically like, because you're trying to do a test and keep things contained, like, you know, you can't have people coming and going, so you want to do it in a time where there's not other crews coming in. I mean, and ideally, too, you are whoever you want in charge of your airbag is going to be fixing it, or you want to understand what's there. I mean, we've had lots of builders have done this where it's like, wow, you know, I've never had one of these happen, and guaranteed probably every house I've ever built has had air leakage in that area because I've always done it that way. And if I'd just known a couple of these things, I would have done that a long time ago because that was like hardly any cost to fix that part. 
Now that's going to cost me something to fix that one, but there, so you have someone like Stan or another energy that can walk through with you and point <coughs> it out and say, this, this, this is really practical, right? Like you want to know that you want to get that knowledge in and you know, sometimes people aren't doing big construction door to door tests after they've done a few because they just feel comfortable. We, you know, that's how comfortable they feel. But having someone there and fixing it on the spot, the energy advisor is still there and go fix it. And, and then, you know, a couple people and then by the, you can check by the time they leave. Did we fix that one? Good. No, check. That's done. That one's done. It's rare for us to find a deficiency that can't be fixed in a few minutes. Uh, and that, so really it just means having someone there, and oftentimes it's the insulator <coughs> that comes with his usual fare of equipment, um, acoustical sealant, uh, tape, it might be top tape, uh, stapler, uh, and perhaps some poly. Quickly on various things, some advisors use different things, so sometimes people use smoke pencils, vape, or incense, various to look, identify leakage. Some people use thermal imaging cameras that would give it images, like show you the air leakage pathways. Uh, you know, there's folks that use smoke machines, so you'll see the smoke coming out like that. You know, but typically what was found is like the best thing, other than those tools, is just having someone that knows what they're doing, knows how to use their blower door test. You feel the leakage, you see where it's happening. But the best thing I think to work with is typically an advisor who's done a bunch of them, it's seamless. I've, I've been in like hundreds of homes just like this one. You know where we always find the leakages? Let's go check. Check there, 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 and you're like, okay, that's where you're going to find it. Uh, and here's what this guy did to fix these things. You know, they, not that in, an energy advisor is there to like uh, advise on all the air barrier approaches because not all of them know that and nor do they, that might be complicated to say that, but they can help you identify leakages and, and provide advice. Well, you know, here's what, uh, you know, Jimmy does to fix these types of things. He uses this approach. Seems to work for him every time. And, you know, that's kind of invaluable advice. So we do an air leakage of this home. It's one home, right? So we're doing one, one home like this. If you're in a townhouse, um, what the step code says, you're supposed to do an air leakage and it's four units of, all, of the whole building. However, that would require four blower doors. There might be a lot of, or it might be complicated. There's a lot of interwall leakage. People have built townhomes and that's hard to address. Step codes just come out with the procedure now. And we noted there that we're going to do individual testing <coughs> on each unit, each four of them. They're going to give you an adjustment. Let's just say these four units, here's the air leakage. 3.7 on one end unit, 3.9 on middle because of interunit leakage, 4.1 here, 3.5. Often there's less air leakage on the outer units because there's a nice air barrier here. Where's the party wall here? There's more leakage. They're going to say you test on each four. They're going to give you an adjustment of 0.5. So you'll minus the 0.5 from there. And then you do a calculation of the wall. So basically he's adding it up and averaging it. So to say, so in this one particular one, you'd get 3.28 air changes, which wouldn't pass step two, but you're going to pass step one. And it is a lot more complicated. And if advisors advising you on how to do this party wall and thinking about your air barrier in the party wall, it's really important. So this is where you might need to spend more time thinking about what your air barrier approach is, because typically, and these have tested, worse all the time than single family residential homes. So as you're building higher steps of the step code, and there's a lot of townhomes going into the township of Langley, a lot of attention needs to be paid to that party wall and a lot of work needs to be done with the energy advisor to make sure you're going to hit your steps. Um, but essentially what uh, we'll have in the past is also allow you to do one by one and then add them up and average by the surface area. The other benefit for builders released is that 0.5, it's 0.50, it's 0.5 air changes per hour a relaxation. So you do are given a bit of relaxation because there's been a realization that these have been harder to hit. But the reason for the 0.5, as Peter's touched on, is because the BC Building Code doesn't call for party walls to be air sealed. It's not required, and therefore inspectors aren't asking for it, and therefore it's just not being done. I mean, it's not like there's nothing there. Drywall provides some air tightness. Uh, if it's a, a sheer wall, plywood provides some air tightness. But for it to really work, like you would need to take it to the, the next level. You can well, still do it as a whole building. Yeah. You have the option to test your air barrier as a whole building, yeah, right. four units, right, if you want, right. or individual units. Yeah. But typically people often are finishing it different. Maybe they're finishing one first and the other, like it doesn't, it gives you more options, what it's saying here. Uh, but where it's going now, while the, step, while the code doesn't require party well air leakage now, I mean, people are increasingly talking about the importance of it. You know, one unit smokes, the other doesn't, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Fire and safety, I mean, it's a good idea to be having a good air barrier between party walls, even though it's not required in the code yet. And that's a discussion happening. Is that code going to change? You know, so the step code's requiring 
Again, if you're trying to hit an air tightness target and there is air leakage and there's challenging with test doing a whole building, you know, it, it, you're better off having more options and trying to tighten up that stand set, tighten up that party wall anyway, but having good air barrier. Um, there's all, there's all a range of different types of um, air tightness training where they actually show you about applying the different types of tape, applying the different types of things. So we've heard from others that uh, some of these trainings are great. They, you know, you're actually applying things that's more hands-on. Here we're talking today and pointing out things, but it's not really a training on doing an air barrier. This, we're just talking about the step codes. Small final stay along seminar is fantastic. Yeah, so there you go. There's a, uh, those are things, you know, and there has in some, at times been um, subsidies through one of the utilities to, to take that. There's also a new website available. If you're looking for uh, financial incentives that are available, a lot of financial and local governments are coming in, like a township of Langley, with financial incentives for building to different steps. If you look on this website, it's cleanbetterhomes.ca, uh, find rebates for building a home. And then you go to a search tool, where you're looking, township of Langley, um, and it'll come up with all kinds, of, it'll show what's available. Fortis has a program here with, for rebates. Um, there's also a Township of Langley energy evaluation rebates, Township of Langley construction, and so on. So wherever you're building, lots of local governments are considering putting in financial incentives. Um, so you should be aware of those, uh, as those are, it's always good to be able to access some additional funds. So for again, um, we'd encourage you, if you don't have information about it, to take some of the brochures, or the Township of Langley brochures. Fortis, it also has details on the Fortis incentive program. So I won't go into details here. That, um, is available on that website. You can find all the details for building um, uh, the incent financial incentives available for the Fortis program. Um, another tool or service that's available through that website is you can call someone if you want to find out about a rebate program in a, in a local government area. You can call someone and they'll, it's like kind of like the call a nurse helpline, but they'll ask you answer your program questions about um, financial incentives in different local government areas. There will be, in very short order, um, also a tool where you can find energy advisors in your community. So if you're, we, as we mentioned, we recommend you need to use an energy advisor along the way, but if wherever you're building, you wanna find out who's operating within your community, there will be a search tool on the same website, say Township of Langley, who's available, and it'll give you a list of energy advisors to be working there. So same thing, your Surrey or wherever you're working. That'll be on there probably within a week, and it's the same type of functionality. So in just a final wrap, um, you know, the value of mid-construction blower door test, I mean, again, this is, well, may not confirm, it gives you a good indication whether you're gonna pass or fail in your air, like, air tightness. Um, it gives you someone like Stan to come in and point out things, highlight where you can do things, talk about what other builders done. Um, again, identify these issues before it's too late. Ideally, as discussed, you're starting way sooner than mid-construction to get this plan, but mid-construction is, um, is a good thing to do. As Stan also indicated, if you wait to the end and then try and fix some of these things, you might take way more time than right now walking around and doing these things. So this is the fastest, most cost-effective way to verify and quantify that leakage problem. And again, like many builders we've had, well, they've said there's lots of great workshops. They said, having someone come to my house and point out all my problems, not and with my particular house, was way more valuable. Because this is how I'm building, and this is my problem that I've created, or I've been doing all along. And that pointing it out, it's just like, wow, that was really great from someone just to show this, this, and that. And guaranteed, I'm, that's been me cutting out, making that early kitsch issue for years. And now I know kind of how I'm going to get around that. So that's our sort of wrap up on uh, mid-construction blower door tests. And we thank you for your time.